significantly more equal. For failure to undertake and succeed in this task will, under our watch, spell the end, as we know it, of nation states and human societies. And so we gathered a very special place, and may our presence here unite us with those living and deceased who had the courage in June 1976 to raise the flag of freedom, of democracy, of equality, and of human dignity. May our presence also unite us with Enoch Sontonga, who in 1897, at the foothills of this campus, this Soweto campus, wrote with great optimism, with hope, with confidence, and with resolve, Africa's liberation anthem, Nkosi Sikelele, Sikelele Africa, God bless Africa. Welcome to Soweto, welcome to the University of Johannesburg, I thank you. Thank you so much indeed, Professor Rensberg. As has been said, uh, this particular lecture is being broadcast um, via the SABC throughout the country and indeed in other parts of the world as well. But we'd also like now to particularly acknowledge the following universities who are listening in and watching our proceedings live. And they are a University College in Dublin, Polytechnic of Namibia, University of the West Indies, Ibadan University in Nigeria, Lund University in Sweden, the National University of Singapore, the University of Dar es Salaam, and the University of Botswana. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us from whichever part of the world you are joining us from. I'd now like to call on Afro Soul sensation, Nomfusi, who is going to render both national anthems for us. Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please rise as that is done. Africa <laughs>
You may be seated. <laughs> and thank you so much to Unom Fosi and the accompanying artists for that rousing rendition of the South African anthem. Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, is the chairman of the Nelson Mandela Foundation. As has already been said, he's also the chancellor of the University of Johannesburg. Please welcome academic and writer extraordinaire, Professor Njabulo Ndebele, otherwise known as my boss. Okay. Good afternoon uh, to you all, uh, distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen uh, who are in this hall, and to all our guests and viewers around the world and the universities that have been listed that are spread across the globe. On behalf of the Nelson Mandela Foundation's Board of Trustees, I thank you all for attending this 13th Nelson Mandela annual lecture. The board uh, comprising of Nigiwe Bigicha, uh, who reminded us that I'm her boss, uh, Caroline Hamilton, Ahmed Kathrada, Maya Makanji, Irene Menel, Silo Mulogo, Khalima Mutlante, Futi Mtoba, Mampela Rampela, Tokyo Sekwale, and myself, we wish to express our profound gratitude to all who have supported this lecture from the time that it started 13 years ago, and in particular, to this particular lecture, which occurs in the second year since our beloved founder's passing. I'm sure all of you feel as I do today, missing Madiba as much as ever, and experiencing his presence. Today we also miss Mrs. Grasha Michelle, who has faithfully attended lectures over the years, first with Madiba and then on her own when he was no longer able to accompany her. Circumstances do not allow her to be with us today, but I know that she is here in spirit. We are also thinking of uh, Archbishop Emeritus uh, Desmond Tutu, who has attended many of uh, our, our lectures in the past, who is unable to be here today, recovering uh, in Cape Town. We think of him today and wish him well. Many individual expressions of thanks for this lecture are due and they will be conveyed by our chief executive in his closing remarks. But I just uh, want to mention uh, two at the, at the onset. And uh, welcome, in particular, the Vice Chancellor Aaron Rensberg of the University of Johannesburg. And thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor, for hosting us. Your university provides us with the ideal venue uh, this year. Welcome also uh, Mr. Premier uh, of the of the Gauteng, Mr. David Makura. We appreciate your presence. Uh, thank you for your support. Vice Chancellor, we are here in Soweto 60 years after the Freedom Charter was adopted here by the Congress of the People in 19 55. The Charter defined the struggle for freedom in South Africa in many ways and influenced profoundly the constitution of the Republic which underpins our democracy. It is articulated, it articulated a dream for all who live in South Africa which poverty and inequality are threatening to unravel at this moment. The state, the private sector, and civil society need to find ways of doing things differently if that dream is to be sustained. 
We look forward to be inspired by our speaker, Professor Thomas Piketty, to keep dreaming and thinking up new and innovative solutions for the future of our country. Professor Piketty, we are deeply honored that uh, you accepted our invitation to deliver the 13th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. We welcome you and your wife, Julia, uh, who have visiting us from, 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 from France to attend this lecture. My board wanted a, 20, a 2015 annual lecturer who would offer an authoritative voice on the global schedules of poverty and inequality. One who would offer us insight into the conditions of the vast majority of South Africans find themselves in. Someone who could go beyond analysis and share ideas for changing what has become a predatory global economic system with dire consequences for human and other populations, a system that arguably is placing the human project around the globe at risk. One who Nelson Mandela would certainly have wanted us to have on stage today. Last year, my board of trustees took a decision to focus the foundation's dialogue endeavor, which is embedded in our founding document, to, around, to focus around these two twin schedules. As a consequence of this, among others, three days ago at the University of Cape Town, we announced the Mandela Initiative, a major new intersectoral project designed to create a national conversation to explore ways of shifting societal patternings by doing things differently. My reference to this initiative today, in a sense, is in, in its own way a kind of launching it as well. This initiative is rooted in four defining characteristics that I will now spell out. The first one, inspiration from our founder, Nelson Mandela, for whom poverty and inequality loomed large through his presidency and retirement. In 2015, 2005, he said, poverty and deprivation in our midst demean all of us. Let us mobilize in one great cooperative national effort the enormous energy of our society in order to overcome and eliminate poverty. The second one, it will be carried by a dynamic partnership engaging the state, civil society, and the private sector. And thirdly, it will draw on deep research and analysis. And on this, I would like to say a few words. This aspect of it is particularly significant from the point of view that the difficult decisions that we have to make in future should be a product of rigorous research and be data-driven. This is particularly important because in order for us to achieve this, the entire system of higher education in South Africa will be galvanized to make a researched input into this initiative. I remember that when I was a, an undergraduate student in 1974, in my final year in Lesotho, I bought a book entitled The Discarded People by Cosmas Desmond. I read it and many years later, I had forgotten about it somehow. 
but it came back with full force when we started hearing about Professor Piketty's book and what it was about. And I went back to this book and discovered to my new, my illumination and deep concern and interest just how much the inequality and poverty that we're seeing in this country is in living memory. Because like many others in this room, we have a personal experience of being moved around the country. And Cos Desmond Cosmas personally visited all the places like Stenkwater, like uh, the uh, Dimbaza, and others that were symbolic, but very much in the news in those days. Some estimates put the figure at 6.5 million people who were shunted around the country. And in particular, from a research perspective, I am interested to know what happened to the people who came from thriving communities had, after decades and decades of successful agriculture. One day, an official came and said, you have to move. And they, overnight, they became impoverished. I'm interested to know because their land was taken over by those who were favored by the state to take over fertile land and build their lives after that. I would like to know what happened to those people, the beneficiaries of so much from the state, and what happened to those that were thrown away by the state and discarded in the manner that they did. Whatever the outcome of those events, live with, with us today. If at that time it was legal and legitimate to do those things, it no longer is today. And today we will ask what are the ethical and moral reasons around which to create wealth and money. Because those reasons, those imperatives, are as important as the economics of it all. The last and fourth factor is a commitment to community level dialogue that is designed to take place all over the country and get South Africans involved in this very massive project since 1994. This then is the context which informed our invitation to Professor Piketty. He has been called the most influential economist in the world for a good reason. A product of the French education system, he got his PhD at the age of 22. He has received honors from many countries, including an honorary doctorate, as you have heard, from the University of Johannesburg just yesterday. His seminal work, Capital in the 21st Century, is an international bestseller. He is read not only by scholars and students, but by journalists, social commentators, activists, and global citizens looking for sustainable solutions to the problem of structural inequalities. And hopefully, in the manner that I've pointed out, we took courage and inspiration from the fact that he and his project drew data covering three centuries in over more than 50 countries. Nothing can be more extensive and more rigorous than that. It is against this background that his counsel is sought by governments, universities, and other institutions of the democratic order. He combines deep research and analysis with robust engagement in both theory and, pol and policy. And most importantly, he offers unique insight into how we might do things differently. I hope I'm not putting you, Professor Piketty, under pressure by, by saying that we cannot wait to hear your lecture, your lecture 
and welcome you warmly to this esteemed platform. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Piketty. Thank you, thank you for your very warm welcome. L let me first uh, apologize for the fact that my English uh, sounds a lot like French, and uh, <laughs> I hope this will be okay uh, with you. L let, me say, let me start by saying how honored and moved uh, I am by being here today for this uh, uh, Nelson Mandela lecture. To, for, for everybody, uh, from my generation, from around the world, uh, South Africa and Nelson Mandela, uh, uh, of course, have a universal uh, meaning. So I, I was born in 1971, and uh, when, when I was a teenager, the South Africa was, was of course, uh, uh, one of the very important uh, uh, countries that I was always hearing about. And when I, I became uh, an adult uh, in 1989, the, you know, in Paris, we were commemorating the 200th uh, anniversary of the French Revolution. But what was really important, what was going on, was elsewhere, was the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of apartheid with the liberation of Nelson Mandela in 1990 and the, the end of apartheid in the following years. And, and you know, being here today, 25 years later, is, is something which uh, I, 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 I find very, uh, very moving and very strong, and I am very honored and grateful for the foundation, you know, for, for inviting, uh, inviting me. Uh, of course, now that we are 25 years after the fall of apartheid, uh, uh, we are all uh, uh, puzzled by the fact that inequality uh, not only is still very high in, in South Africa, but even in some way uh, has been rising, and in some way income inequality uh, is even higher today than 20 years ago, which is extremely puzzling uh, for uh, all of us, and this is something we, we want to better understand. And we also know from historical experience that extreme inequality of the, 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 with the kind of level that we observe in South Africa is not good for development and growth. And, and it can also lead to, uh, to uh, uh, violent uh, reactions and violent events. And, and, and we all have in mind the, the uh, very violent episodes in, in uh, Maracana uh, uh, three years ago. And, and we know from historical experience that if inequality is not addressed through peaceful means and peaceful uh, democratic institution, uh, it, it's always uh, uh, potentially a source of, uh, of violence, and, and, and of course this can uh, this can happen again. So, wh what I really would like to do uh, in this uh, in this lecture is to try to see what we can learn from the historical experience of other countries with inequality uh, in order to better uh, uh, analyze the future opportunities for a country like South Africa, but more generally for, for, for the world uh, issue of inequality. So le let me say right away, and I will, I will speak more about this, that the, the fact that inequality today uh, in some dimensions is higher in South Africa than what it was in, uh, 20 years ago in terms of concentration of income is partly due to international factors which are not completely, uh, of course, under the control of the South African government. And I will, uh, I will, I will come back to this uh, later. And I think the international community, broadly speaking, has a big responsibility for the situation of inequality in South Africa, in Africa in general, and in the world in general. And, and some of the solution will have to come from the international community. But that will not be enough just to blame the, the international uh, uh, factors. And, and I think there are also deeper reasons for, for the fact that in terms of reduction of inequality, the, the South African uh, uh, revolution, so to speak, uh, did not uh, deliver as much as one uh, might have expected. And, and generally speaking, the, the, I, I would say the general reason is that equality in formal rights and in basic civil rights 
uh, even though it is of course very important, the, the right to move uh, in the country, the right to take uh, uh, all possible occupation, at least in theory, uh, the right to vote. All these formal civil rights are extremely important, but equality in formal rights is not sufficient to, re to reach real equality. So if you want effective rights uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to move, uh, it's not enough to, to be formally allowed to go to the other part of the country. If you cannot uh, pay uh, rent or housing to go where the jobs are, uh, in effect, the right to move uh, remains a, 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 you know, a limited, a very limited right. And, and more generally, I will, I will argue that, that uh, we now need to think harder about how to secure uh, uh, effective rights, including uh, right to work for a decent wage, uh, right to good quality education, right to access to property, and finally, and maybe most importantly, right to real economic and political democracy, including uh, sharing of economic power uh, in companies and participatory governments, both in the public and the private sector. So, in this presentation, I'm going to make three different points. You know, in the first part, I will first try to uh, put the issue of inequality uh, into uh, an historical perspective and see what we can learn from historical uh, experiences with uh, reduction of inequality in, in different uh, countries. Uh, then, in the, the second point will be about the solution uh, uh, for reducing inequality in South Africa that we can draw from, from historical experience. And then the third part of the, of the lecture will be about the global response to inequality and the need for uh, international action. So let me first start with history and the historical perspective. I, I think it's important because there's a lot of historical amnesia in the, in the world sometimes about uh, inequality. And, and I think it's important to take this broad uh, historical and comparative uh, perspective. And, as a, as a scholar, as an academic, my work has been primarily the work of, a, of an historian trying to collect historical data on inequality and wealth. I, I should stress that uh, this uh, was possible only through a very collective research project. So I, I started working on the inequality of income and wealth in France about 15 years ago, but then I was very fortunate to find uh, many collaborators in many countries, uh, uh, Tony Atkinson in Britain, who also worked on, on the case of uh, South Africa, uh, uh, Emmanuel Saez uh, in the US, who also worked on Japan and Canada, Fagundo Alvaredo in Argentina and Chile and Mexico, Abhijit Banerjee in India, and I cannot make the complete list, but it's really a very international global collective research program that is now continuing. I, sh I should stress that we still know too little about inequality and, and we know a little bit more than we used to and I, I will try to share some of the lessons that we have learned, but we still know too little. We are in the social sciences, there are different ways to interpret history and our objective is not to come with ready uh, to apply solution or magic bullet, but rather to to contribute to a more informed uh, democratic discussion about inequality. And ultimately, the, the objective is really that everybody, normal citizen, can uh, uh, look at this data, look at the book written from this data, and make their own opinion, because these issues are too important to be left to a small group of experts. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's wrong to believe. Sometimes economists like to pretend that they have built uh, an economic science that is so sophisticated that the rest of the world cannot understand. But of course, this is a big joke. And, and, but what's important is not to let economists do that. I think it's important to realize that issues of inequality, income, wealth, capital, public debt uh, are not technical issues. These are issues on, on which everybody must have an opinion uh, because ultimately this is what determines uh, uh, political change. So if we look at this historical database that we have collected, uh, probably the, the most important finding is that we cannot simply uh, rely on market forces and trickle-down mechanism uh, in order to deliver the right level of inequality. And so this very optimistic theory of economic development, which at some point was described as the theory of the Kuznets curve, 
according to which you have a natural reduction of inequality in advanced stages of development. Well, this theory is just wrong if you take this very broad international perspective that we have taken in our research. In particular, one uh, very important uh, finding uh, is that if you look at the reduction of inequality that happened during the first half of the 20th century, in North America, in Europe, or in Asia, uh, you can see that this has nothing to do with a natural uh, process based on, on market forces. Uh, it is due to a large extent to the very violent shocks of World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, and most importantly, to the new policies, the new social policies, welfare state policies, the new fiscal policies, progressive taxation, that were finally accepted by the elites after these violent shocks and also after the Bolshevik Revolution, which put strong pressures on the elites uh, in Western countries to accept reforms which until 1914, until World War I, were, uh, uh, were refused. Now, that, that's a very important lesson. Uh, in particular, this is particularly striking uh, for my own country, France, to see that until 1914, until World War I, you actually have rising concentration of wealth, uh, and with a level of concentration of wealth which was probably, if anything, higher than a century before or, or 130 years before under the Ancien Regime, under the French Revolution. And that's very striking for several reasons. First, because at that time, in 1910, 1900, 1914, the French Republican elite, financial, economic, and political elite were very strongly uh, in a very strong denial of this. And basically, they were saying, well, no, this cannot be possible because we have made the French Revolution. So this is enough. You know, we are, we are now a country of equals. We don't have aristocrats anymore. We have equal formal rights. We have the right to move, the right to take any occupation, the right to property, the right to vote, at least for men at that time. Uh, and, and therefore, we are a country of equals. So, for instance, we don't need progressive taxation. And it's very interesting to see that France, you know, France sometimes likes to portray itself as a country of equality. But, you know, there's always a lot of hypocrisy in all these kind of statements about a country of equality, country of opportunity. And, you know, the elites have a lot of imagination to, for self-serving... Uh, <laughs> for self-serving statements and to, in order to justify the system from which they benefit. So in the end, France was actually the last country to create an income tax in the summer of 1914. And this was not to pay for education or for schools. This was to pay to go to war with Germany. Okay? And other countries had already created the income tax before, the US in 1913, Britain in 1908, Prussia, Japan, Sweden in 1880, 1890. France was the very last one among developed countries to create an income tax. What's interesting is to understand why. It's because there was this feeling among the elite that, well, we have done the French Revolution, we don't have aristocrats, we are a country of equals, so we don't need progressive taxation. Britain, of course, would need progressive taxation because they have all this aristocracy with this queen and this concentrated land, so they should create progressive tax right away. But in France, we don't need it because we've done the French Revolution. So that's interesting, first, for historical reason, but also because we can see that you know, the elites have a lot of imagination to, to justify their position. It's also interesting because this failure of the French Revolution, of the, which is sort of the bourgeois revolution par, excell par excellence, which gave equal rights you know, before 1789, before the French Revolution, uh, a small group of aristocrats, which were about 1% of the population, had a very uh, privileged right uh, regarding the fiscal system, regarding political right. There were also restrictions to mobility uh, within the country and to uh, the kind of occupation you can take depending on your social origins. So, the, the, you know, there were privileges in the, in the country. And at that time, the, 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 you know, the hope during the French Revolution is that if we have equal rights to take all occupation, to move equal right to property, then this should be enough to bring a country of equals. And the fact that it doesn't work this way, and that, uh, in fact, in the, in the, over the course of the 19th century and in the early 20th century, we get to a concentration of wealth that is, in some ways, even higher than under the Ancien Regime, is very interesting because it shows uh, the, probably the, one of the deep reasons that I try to explain in my research is that the, the, the fact of being a, a republic rather than a monarchy you know, I'm, I'm very happy to be in a republic, by the way, but uh, the fact of being in a republic rather than a monarchy doesn't really change 
the deep economic mechanisms through which the concentration of wealth uh, is working. And in particular, the fact that all, all over the 19th century, you have a rate of return to capital uh, that is markedly higher than the growth rate of the economy, four, five percent, six percent per year for the, the new capital investment in the manufacturing sector with, as compared to a growth rate of one, two percent per year. Well, this gap between the two can explain to a large extent why we continue with a very large concentration of wealth until World War I. So it's, it's only very violent shocks which occurred in the 20th century which finally uh, convinced uh, the elite uh, to accept a number of fiscal and social reforms that, that were not adopted before. Now, I think this is of interest to, to, to South Africa uh, because, you know, of course, I, you know, I don't want to compare the French Revolution and the South African Revolution. It's a completely different context. And in a way, you know, the inequality regime that existed under apartheid is much, was much more oppressive and violent than ancien regime in France. The, the, well, first, the, the group that had more rights than the rest of the population, namely the, the whites, uh, uh, was much bigger. You know, it was not 1% of the population, it was 10, 15 percent, so that's, uh, you know, it's more difficult to deal with a situation like this when, than with 1%. Uh, the difference in color of skin is also important because uh, when everybody is white in France, you can sort of forget uh, a couple of generations later who comes from what group, uh, which is more difficult with the color of skin. No, but it's a, it's a trivial remark, but it makes a big difference in the long run in order to move uh, ahead and solve this kind of, of situation. And, and finally, the, the, the repression of basic rights which was happening under apartheid was much more violent with restrictions to mobility, and we had a reference to this, and expulsion, and the uh, very strong territorial uh, discrimination, uh, which did not really exist in France in the 18th century, and, and which in some ways looked more like the kind of serfdom uh, system that we had a couple of centuries before. So, you know, the challenge is the system from which South Africa comes from is, uh, in a way, a much more oppressive inequality system than France under the Ancien Regime. And that's another reason why formal equal rights is not sufficient to bring equality. So one of the lessons I draw from this historical part of my lecture is that uh, we need more than formal equal rights, rights to move, rights to take occupation. That's important, but that's, that's not enough. So let me now turn to the, the issue of inequality in South Africa today and what kind of, of response to, to reduce inequality we can think of. First, what, what do we know about the level of inequality in South Africa, how this has changed since the fall of apartheid and how does this compare to other countries? We know too little, you know, in particular regarding wealth concentration, but everything we know suggests uh, an unusually high level of inequality, higher than what we observe pretty much everywhere else in the world. So just to take one number which I find particularly striking, if we use the South African income tax data together with national accounts, household survey, and we do the same for other countries, um, uh, we find that the share of total income going to the top 10% uh, income earners in South Africa currently, right now, is between 60 and 65% of total income for the top 10%. Just to make comparison, in Brazil, using similar data, we are between 50 and 55%. Uh, in the US, we are between 45 and 50%. And in most European countries, we are between 30 and 35%. So with 60 to 65, just to remember these orders of magnitude, uh, 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 South Africa is really at the top of the class, so to speak, and, and is in a way 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 out uh, other uh, experience that we that we can see of. Now, if we if we try to explain this, you know, some people say, well, that's because we have very high unemployment, and certainly high unemployment is a big big problem to solve and to address in South Africa. But I don't think this can explain. I think is this extremely and unusually high level of inequality. I think unemployment is more a symptom of inequality, unequal skills, unequal distribution across the territories uh, where people cannot move to where the jobs are and have not access to the right skills. Uh, uh, but this in itself cannot explain uh, such a high level of income concentration. Just to take an example, there are other countries in the world, uh, unfortunately, where you have very high unemployment. You know, in Spain or Greece, you have also 25% rate of unemployment.
the wall of income inequality. You still have 30 to 35 percent of total income to the top 10 percent as compared to 60 to 65 uh, in, in, in South Africa. So even if the data is not perfect, I think it's very clear that the extreme level of inequality that we have in South Africa is, is much more than just unemployment. It has to do certainly with the legacy of the apartheid. Uh, in particular, it is striking to see that what's really different in South Africa as compared to other countries, the top 10 percent share. If you take the top 1 percent share, it's not so different from the US today, but if you take the top 10 percent share, then it's really higher in, in South Africa. So this really suggests that what's specific is that you have a relatively large group in the country, around 10 percent, which is very far away from the rest of the population. And of course, this group historically has been predominantly or almost exclusively uh, white. And, and even uh, today, if you look at the data we have to Within, especially within the top 5% or top 1%, it will be up to 80% uh, white. So things uh, have, have changed a little bit, but, but we are still very much with this same structure of, of uh, racial uh, inequality that, that, we, that we used to have. So now, how can we uh, make progress? So le let me make clear that I am not, uh, uh, you know, I'm not here to, to give lessons to South Africa. I'm trying to see uh, uh, what we can learn from historical experience. Certainly, the international context has played a role in rising inequality in South Africa uh, since the 1990s. Uh, let me mention a, a number of reasons. Uh, you know, the, the certainly financial deregulation, which has happened uh, over in the world over in the past 25 years, has, has contributed to rising inequality. More generally, the, the fall of communism around 1990 has opened the way for a new era of unlimited faith uh, in self-regulated markets, and, and in some cases this has clearly gone too far. Financial deregulation is one uh, example, and this has contributed to the rise uh, of uh, financial fragility, and, and which eventually has contributed to the financial crisis of 2008. More generally, uh, if you have um, um, uh, globalization without proper regulation. Uh, globalization in itself can be a powerful force to reduce inequality at the world level. But if you don't have proper regulation at the same time, uh, in particular regarding taxation, uh, this can contribute to rising inequality. Also, rising commodity price, of course, has contributed to rising uh, top income shares in South Africa. But it will not be enough just to blame these international uh, factors. Uh, uh, I, I think the, the, there are really domestic uh, solutions to the, to, the, to the inequality in South Africa. So, as I already said, I, I think there are at least four areas of rights where we need to turn to a policy of effective rights. Uh, rights to uh, uh, labor, work for a decent wage, uh, right to high quality education, right to access to property, and right to economic and political democracy. So let me just say a bit more about these four rights. Regarding right to work for a decent wage, uh, I, I think the, the discussion that, that South Africa is having right now about the introduction of a national minimum wage is extremely important. And I, I think that from the historical, historical and comparative experience we have, uh, in, in my view, uh, if we are able to find the right level for the national minimum wage, then definitely South Africa uh, could and should introduce a national minimum wage. Uh, there are countries in the world, not only in the rich world, but also emerging countries like Brazil, uh, who have a national minimum wage. We were able to find the right level for the national minimum wage, although these are much bigger countries than South Africa, you know, 200 million inhabitants, a lot of geographical disparity, and I think uh, South Africa should be able to, to, to find the, uh, the, the right level for the national minimum wage, and this is a way to avoid situation of, of, of extreme uh, exploitation of uh, low-skilled workers, particularly in areas where they have limited opportunity to move. Now, this in itself is not going to solve the, the key problem, which is the inability to access uh, uh, higher paying jobs. And so here the second important effective right that needs to be strengthened is the right to high quality uh, education together with the right with, with adequate public infrastructure, uh, uh, including um, uh, transportation uh, infrastructure. So regarding 
public education, I think it is fair to say that the, the quality of public primary education and junior secondary education that is available to the most disadvantaged group uh, in this country is, is not satisfactory and that uh, uh, this should be a national priority and a lot of progress could be made in this direction. So, I understand that many people, in particular many business leaders that I have met in recent days, are, you know, are very skeptical about the capacity of the government to deliver this, but on the other hand, I think there's no other option than to try to improve the functioning and to contribute uh, to, you know, to pay the tax that we need in order to finance this public sector of education. You know, there's no other strategy. The, the strategy according to which you know, we could do it through uh, privatizing uh, the education system, the health system, and let the business sector do it, uh, I, I think it uh, uh, will not work. I think what has worked in history uh, in order to have sustainable and equitable growth uh, is to is to have a well-functioning uh, uh, public education and health system and, and South Africa uh, uh, should go in this, in this direction. Uh, the third effective right which I want to stress is the right to access to property. So that's probably one of the more complicated uh, rights because, uh, of course, it involves uh, very difficult and sensitive issues, including land reform. Uh, let me just say that if we take a broad international historical perspective, we see in many countries in history much more ambitious uh, land reform than what we have seen in, in South Africa uh, uh, since the end of the apartheid. Uh, I think it's fair to say, or at least many uh, observers have noted, that the uh, black uh, economic empowerment uh, strategies, which were mostly based on uh, voluntary market transactions, at market values, uh, were not that successful at, at spreading uh, the wealth and at limiting the extreme concentration uh, of wealth uh, from which we start in, in South Africa. So I think we, we need to think again about uh, more and ambitious land reform. I also think that like many other countries, but maybe probably even more than other countries, South Africa will benefit from increased uh, transparency about wealth and about who owns what in South Africa. And I, I think it, it is very difficult to have a reasonable democratic conversation about wealth uh, with so little information. So in particular, uh, people talk about uh, BE policy and their impact, but in fact, there's really very little data on wealth. That's partly because uh, uh, access to the estate uh, tax data uh, uh, is extremely difficult, to say the least, uh, in, in South Africa. So the recent estate tax, but it's very difficult to know uh, how many taxpayers uh, uh, transmitted wealth between uh, 1 million, 2 million rands, uh, 10 million, 20 million rands year after year. And, and most importantly, uh, even if this data was available, this would be only information about wealth at death and, you know, wealth of the living is even more interesting than wealth at death in a way, and I, I think uh, it will be uh, important uh, and absolutely uh, possible for South Africa to introduce uh, an annual uh, tax uh, uh, on net wealth, a progressive annual tax on net individual wealth, even if it comes with very low tax rate to begin with, say, you know, zero percent uh, below uh, one million uh, runs uh, in wealth, 0.1 percent between 1 and 10 million, and 0.5 percent above 10 million. You know, I'm just putting numbers so that people have an idea. Uh, I think even with very relatively low tax rates such as this one, the big advantage of an annual tax on wealth is that it will produce democratic transparency about wealth, and we would know more about who owns what in South Africa and how this is changing over time. And I think it's, it's very important in a country to be able to look year after year at how the different social groups and the different wealth groups are doing and how they are benefiting or not benefiting from growth and development. And if we don't have this kind of public information, then, uh, you know, this is what gives away to very extreme statements from one way or another, from both sides, and it's, it makes it very difficult to come to, to reasonable and, and peaceful solutions. So I think, you know, I, I understand that, you know, many people in the business community might be against that, but, you know, in the end, in the long run, I think it's, it's in the interest of the business community to promote transparency about wealth, because if we don't have...
you know, if you if you refuse transparency, it must be that there's something to hide. So you know, that's that's not that's not good in order to build trust in a country. I think it's very important to to uh, to, to have that kind of transparency about income and wealth uh, dynamics. And, and finally, the last and fourth uh, uh, effective right, which I would like to stress. Uh, has to do with economic and political democracy. I think it's, uh, it's important in South Africa, like in other countries in the world, to have a, a new discussion about uh, uh, worker participation in companies, uh, participatory governance. Uh, there are many countries in the world, including countries that are doing very well in terms of economic efficiency and export and competitiveness, like Sweden and Germany, where workers uh, have a strong uh, power in the board of companies. So in, in Sweden, you have one third of the seats in board of companies that go to workers. Uh, in Germany, it's up to one half. And you know, apparently, this does not prevent them from producing uh, good products and exporting all over the world. So, you know, in, in, in my country, in my country, in France, for a long time, employers. And, and business people were completely against it. Well, they are still against it, but the difference is that two years ago there, there was a law saying, okay, now there's going to be one employee representative out of 12 uh, uh, board members, so that's very, that's much less than in Sweden uh, than in Germany, but because, you know, everybody was telling employers in France, well, look, this is what they do in Germany, and, and you know, German firms are doing better than French firms, so why do you don't want workers on board? In the end, maybe it's a way to involve workers in the strategy of the company. So instead of just fighting, you know, you can have effective discussion about the strategy of the company. And sometimes this can also be a way to promote more long run strategy than just short term uh, maximization of profits. Now, let me turn to the third and final part of, my, of, of this lecture, uh, which has to do with the global response to inequality, because I think it's clear that, you know, South Africa cannot solve all uh, inequality problems in the world alone, and, and there are many issues for which uh, the, the rich countries, in particular countries in the north, have a huge responsibility, in particular in order to promote uh, global financial transparency and fight against tax havens. And more generally, uh, it is clear that countries in the north have, have a huge historical responsibility uh, for uh, uh, inequality in the world today and poverty in many southern countries. Europe has a, has a direct responsibility for the existence of the apartheid in the first place, and more generally, uh, the apartheid system was simply one extreme version of a form of colonial uh, inequality structure uh, that you see in, in, in French colonies, in British colonies, uh, all across uh, uh, colonial uh, history. So, you know, the French Revolution again, uh, was very strong in terms of abstract principles. You know, Article 1 of the Declaration of Right of 1789 uh, was saying uh, uh, that all men should, be, should have equal rights, that social distinction should be based only on common utility. But in practice, the French Republic uh, went on to uh, develop, uh, you know, one of the worst uh, colonial uh, empires in history. And, and uh, you know, the French revolutionary said in 1792, that they wanted to abolish uh, slavery. But then few, uh, the, the government of France under Napoleon and under the monarchies reinstated slavery, which was finally abolished in 1848. And, and when Haiti uh, uh, took seriously the French Revolution and decided that they would be uh, independent and decided to be independent in 1804. Uh, as you probably know, you know, what happened is that not only France was very unhappy, but France said in the end, in 1825, okay, you're going to be independent, but you're going to pay the price for this. And there's going to be a large compensation to the slave owners, to us, for you being free. So what happened is that there was this very large public debt that was imposed on Haiti, which Haiti had to reimburse until the middle of the 20th century. And all along the 19th century, Haiti is paying interest payment to France as a compensation for the fact that the slave owners are not getting income from their slaves. <laughs> and you know, there is so much historical amnesia. You know, we forget about these things. And when Haiti 
started to ask for compensation again a few years ago, you know, in 2004, and when they were commemorating the 200th anniversary, the French government said, okay, we won't go to Haiti for the anniversary because we don't want to hear about this compensation. Uh, so, you know, this is just an example to say that, you know, historical amnesia and the responsibility of, of northern countries in, in today's inequality uh, situation in the world is, is enormous. Now, if we look at the future, because, you know, just talking about the, the past is not enough, although in this case, I think it is still time for compensation and for reimbursing the debt that was paid uh, from Haiti to France. Uh, but if we, look, if we look at the future and from a more global uh, perspective, I think you know, it is clear that Europe uh, and North America uh, have a strong responsibility uh, uh, if we want to encourage uh, financial transparency in the world. And, you know, I think Europe and, and North America should stop having a double language with Africa, uh, which is that on the one hand, they always give lessons about good governance and transparency, etc. And on the other hand, uh, their own multinational companies and their own wealthy citizens <laughs> are are the very ones who are benefiting from financial opacity and they are nothing at all about it. They are doing nothing at all about it. So there's really a double language which I think is, is uh, uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely terrible. I think, you know, what, what Africa needs is not uh, uh, foreign aid. You know, Africa is not asking for help. What Africa needs is to have an international legal system uh, that allows African countries to make multinational companies and wealthy uh, citizens pay their fair tax. And, and, this is, and, and this is what, uh, what, uh, what Europe and, and, and North America should, should now offer. So I think there are two, at least two concrete uh, proposals uh, that uh, you know, the Northern countries should, should uh, on which they should make, uh, make substantial uh, progress. First one is that there should be a lot more transparency about how much uh, multinational companies from Europe and North America are paying in tax when they are doing business uh, in Africa. And so the, the European Parliament sort of voted a text about this two years ago, but it's not sufficient information disclosure. And in addition, the information is actually very difficult to access. So, you know, it's a, it's a very strange system where the, 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 the companies are supposed to disclose information, but in the end, it's so well hidden in, in remote reports that are not accessible freely online that nobody can get the information. And in any case, the requirements that were made uh, in terms of information disclosure were completely insufficient to compute uh, what we would like to compute in order to, to impose uh, a better behavior on this, on this company. Now, the second proposal, which I think is, is even uh, more important, is that Europe and North America should accept the creation of a world uh, financial register on financial assets, uh, which, is, uh, which will be a central repository for financial assets so that we will know who owns what financial assets all across the world. Now, some of you might react by saying, oh, but this is completely utopian. How could we do that? Well, let me tell you that, in fact, we already have this kind of central uh, uh, repository for assets because that's useful for private companies to know who owns them. You know, now you don't have paper titles for a long time, so it's all electronic titles, and you need someone to keep track of who owns what in the world. Otherwise, you could have different people who claim that they own the same company, which will create a number of problems. So you have central repository who keep this information, but these are private institutions. These are not public institutions. So they are called uh, Clearstream or Eurostream uh, in Europe. Uh, they, are, they are called uh, um, uh, National Depository Trust Corporation uh, in the US. So these are private corporations who are offering uh, these services to uh, financial companies uh, so that they, they keep track of who owns them. But these private institutions do not collaborate with the public institution, and in particular, do not send their information to tax administration. So I think it is time that governments in Europe and North America in particular, but all across the world, take control 
of this private depository institution and create a public world registry of financial assets. I think, you know, first, that will be useful also for financial regulation. You know, when we try to uh, monitor a world financial crisis and nobody has any idea of who owns what in the world, you know, this creates problems also uh, just for macroeconomic policy and basic financial regulation. But most importantly, this will be important uh, for taxation policy because this would this is what would allow the different countries to, to better know who owns what uh, in their own country and to impose uh, uh, minimal taxation. Uh, now, this is possible. In particular, uh, uh, the European Union and the United States are about to, to, uh, to negotiate a new transatlantic treaty to, to reduce uh, uh, tax on trade. But, you know, the bottom line is that there's no tax on trade anymore. So there's not much to do in this treaty. And that will be a unique opportunity to, to tell to the world, okay, now we're really going to be serious to fight tax havens. And that will be very important for everybody in the world, but particularly for Africa, because if we take the existing estimates of what fraction of uh, uh, the world uh, financial assets are held in tax havens, then the fraction is much bigger uh, in African countries or for the Middle East uh, than it is for, for Europe or, or in France. The, the, the best estimates we have for, for Africa is that between 30 and 50 percent of financial wealth is held offshore. So clearly, uh, this is in effect a way to take away from Africa some of the resources uh, that are necessary uh, for, for development. So again, uh, just to, to, to conclude, uh, I don't think what needs Africa is, uh, you know, a, a new form of foreign aid, which in any case, you know, aid flows, let me also remind uh, to you this basic fact, which is that all aid flows going to Africa uh, are less than the official uh, uh, outgoing profit flows uh, going out of Africa and that are paid to owners, uh, in particular in Europe and North America. Now, these are the official flows. Okay? So if we think of uh, the unofficial flows uh, going to, uh, to, uh, to tax havens, uh, again, the estimates uh, we have are that these are at least of the same order of magnitude, so the total will be, uh, will be vastly larger than the, uh, at least twice as large than the, than the, than the aid flow. So again, what, what, what we need really for the future is not so much to, 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 to talk about aid, but simply to change the international legal system uh, so that African governments can conduct a tax policy without being always threatened sometimes by their own business community to go away and not contribute to the common good. And, you know, I, I understand some people today are saying, okay, but, you know, we, we could just organize uh, the system through uh, voluntary donation and charitable giving. And, uh, you know, I, I understand that uh, people who have a lot of money would like just to decide how much they want to contribute to such or such project. But, you know, it's very difficult to organize a society like this. It's very difficult to organize a society where thousands of people just want to decide for themselves how much they want to contribute to the public good. So we, we need a legal system, in particular an international legal system that allows uh, African countries uh, to, to develop a, a fair tax system that's asking uh, to the those at the top, at least as much uh, as those uh, uh, in the middle and at the bottom, which is not the case uh, as, of, as of today. Let me now, as a general conclusion, you know, try to be optimistic about the, the, the future. You know, I, I said, uh, you know, there are big challenges ahead, but there are solutions, and there are peaceful solutions to address inequality. Let me be also optimistic about South Africa and, and Africa. Uh, I, I, was, I was making this comparison with the South African Revolution, the French Revolution. South Africa and France have, have, a, have a lot in common. In a way, today they almost have the same size. You know, the population of France is 60 million. The population uh, of, of South Africa is uh, 55 million. So it's you know, almost the same, the same size. But a big difference is that uh, uh, France has had a stagnation of population for a very long time. So the population of France was already 40 million a century ago and, and 30 million at the time of the French Revolution. So, you know, it's almost the same country, almost the same families, almost the same. Whereas South Africa uh, has gone through an enormous population growth and it's a very young and dynamic and energetic uh, country. And, and South Africa uh, in 1910, at the time of the creation of the uh, South African Union, had 6 million. 
inhabitants, including uh, 5 million uh, black and colored and 1 million white. And, and now we have gone from 10 to 55 with uh, uh, 5 white and 50 blacks and colored. So this is, this is not the same country. This is uh, when you multiply the size of a country by 10, and, and, and the population as of 1980, at the, in the early 80s, was around 30 million. So the country has gone from 30 to 55. Now, these are enormous challenges. So when we talk about public infrastructure, public education, you know, it's difficult to keep up with this. It's difficult, but in the long run, uh, I think this is an asset. I think the use of South Africa and the energy of the uh, population of South Africa is an asset. Uh, I think it's better to have positive population growth, well, maybe not enormous population growth, but positive rather than negative population growth. And, you know, when I see Africa, you know, European countries who have negative population growth, uh, uh, I think, you know, for the future, that's very frightening in terms of inequality and in terms of just what these countries are, are going to become with the aging. And, and, you know, some countries like France are doing now a bit more children than, than others like Germany. Germany is a bit more uh, open to migrants recently. But then you have many countries in Eastern Europe, you know, they don't, they don't want children and they don't want migrants. Either. So, you know, they are, so they are going to disappear. And, and now South Africa and Africa are not going to disappear. And, and I think if these challenges that we have referred to today are addressed adequately, you know, I think uh, Africa and South Africa are the, are the future of, of the world. And so let me conclude this. And thanks a lot for your attention. Another warm round of applause for Professor Piketty, ladies and gentlemen. You have indeed, sir, given us plenty of food for thought and given us very clear policy direction and interventions which can be taken to reverse the inequality that South Africa has. We, of course, remember, as you spoke to us this afternoon, that we hold the dubious honor of being the opening chapter of your book. The things that you have reminded of us today will help us to ensure that we never have to endure another Marigana again. Let it move from policy to action. Professor Piketty, we thank you for your time and your inputs this afternoon. Let me now call on Silo Hatang, the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, to say a few words. Thank you very much, uh, Nikki. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. I think having spent uh, three days with you, I can sort of show off a bit of my French and uh, say those who don't know French call, me, call you Thomas, but those who know French call you Thomas. <laughs> and I also learned two more words, Prof, and uh, I'm, I'm again just showing off uh, uh, that uh, I, I should have said bonjour at the beginning and, uh, and uh, to say merci beaucoup. I think you'll agree with me that Professor Piketty has stimulated our minds and challenged us to action. We invited him to deliver the 13th annual lecture because he is someone who speaks to both scholarly and popular discourses, someone who combines deep research and analysis with robust engagement in both theory and policy. Most importantly for us, he's making vital contributions in addressing what have become critical questions for the Nelson Mandela Foundations. And these are, how can we overcome oppressive patterns of poverty and inequality? How can we do things differently in order to ensure that all who live in South Africa 
can enjoy the fruits of freedom. Professor Piketty, you have not disappointed us today at all. Thank you for your insights. Thank you for your challenge. You are not punting a blueprint, nor are you offering a silver bullet, but you are giving us hope that we can do things differently, that there are strategies for effecting meaningful change, that there are sustainable solutions to intractable problems confronting us. You have affirmed today what you articulated in the introduction of your book, Capital in the 21st Century, beware of those who have all the answers. Follow those who are asking the right questions and push hard for more transparency. I tried to count how many times you mentioned the word transparency today. I think I lost count at about six. And that more access to information and relevant data is critical. That open governance is good governance. Freedom of information is a founding concept you'll be happy to know for the Nelson Mandela Foundation. And we'll keep working hard to promote it in our country. Thank you for reminding us of this crucial element, Prof. In the audience today is a young woman, a student of economics, who soon after the last annual lecture recommended Professor Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century to one of my colleagues. I'd like you to please help me as I acknowledge Sonia Palazzi. You were absolutely right. Thank you for your inspiration. And we hope that the oldies who are here can hear that we listen to young people because I think she is about 22 and she recommended this book. So it, it means that we need to be doing more. I know you never really feel a woman's age, but I've, I've got the mic, so I thought I should take care of it. So we read the book and felt the thrill of understanding in fresh ways the global and historical context within which South Africa's struggle against poverty and inequality is unfolding. We heard Professor Piketty's call not to allow the past and the present to drag the future down with their terrible weight. In fact, right at the end, he says, of, the, of his book, he says, the past will devour the future if we are not careful. We were moved by his reminder to listen closely to the ghosts of those who are still to be born. Please note uh, a prof's call. This call that I just told you about came right at the end of the book. And I'm saying this uh, to prove, Nikiwe, that I'm not one of those who are claiming to have read the book. And uh, uh, I, I need to tell you that uh, we have about 1,000 public participants today in the audience. And this number, uh, you, have to, you have to justify why you had to come to, be, to the lecture. So um, people in the field which says, why should you be accepted? About 500 of them wrote there, I must be the only one who read that book. <laughs> so I, 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 every now and, gig, and then my colleague Lee Davis, who deals with uh, accreditation, would, would burst out laughing. So when you ask him, why are you laughing? He says, um, no, I've just seen another unique first one to have read the book. Uh, only, if only they knew that they are number 499. Professor Piketty, be assured that the foundation will be using your work for many more years to come. In his speech earlier, Professor Ndebele mentioned the Nelson Mandela Initiative, which we launched recently at UCT. It's going to be one of our flagship programs for the next three years. We hope that this project will respond to Prof's call that we remember the forgotten people. We will make sure that the initiative engages with your work as the process unfolds. And I will feel free to call on you whenever a need arises. And I'd like to remind you that Madiba once said, don't call me, 
I'll call you. Uh, but you are welcome to call us also. <laughs> when you see that you, we are not following on what you've asked us to do, please feel free to call. It remains for me now to thank the people who made this possible today. The University of Johannesburg, thank you for hosting us so elegantly. I think they deserve it. They deserve it because they have many firsts today. For the first time in the history of the annual lecture, the 13th one, we have the youngest speaker sitting at 44 years old. I must tell you, I made a mistake of telling uh, Deputy Chief Justice uh, Moseneke uh, your, your age. So he then turned to me and said, how old are you? So I, I, I gave him my age, and he said, oh, so he's your contemporary. So I'm not sure what it means. Uh, uh, we will have a sidebar at the end, Chief Justice, just to understand what it meant. Uh, um, another first is that um, in the history of the annual lecture, we always sit at about 200 public participants. This time, we're sitting at 1,000, just over 1,000 public participants. Another big first is that uh, the lecture always hovers around 1,000 people in the audience, sitting in the audience. This time, we're sitting just over 2,000 people sitting here. And of course, the biggest first is that we were competing with the rugby and we're still victorious. <laughs> I'd like to also thank my board of trustees. I'd like to thank you for your wisdom and unstinting support. Prof, thank you very much for your support. Always, I know when I look behind me or in front of me, you're there. Thank you very much. The SABC, thank you for working with us, as always, to get the lecture out to bigger audiences than we can fit in any auditorium. <laughs> the biggest thank goes to people who made it possible for Piketty actually to physically be here. And uh, all of you know why I say that. Uh, you know, he uh, was saying that a couple of days ago that he, he knows numbers. He can tell you about billions and zillions, and, but he got almost tripped by two pages. <laughs> so the number two is cursed for <laughs> Professor Piketty. So I'd like to thank the French ambassador, Ambassador Bebeer. Thank you very much for your help. Trevor Manuel. Uh, Ntade Trevor Manuel, thank you very much for your help. The DG of Home Affairs, Ntatia Plain, in his absence, thank you very much for your help. Uh, Deputy Minister Butima Namela, uh, these call, the calls that were made, just to tell you how serious this matter was, were made between the, the hours of 10 o'clock at night until the next day. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm to blame if he didn't sleep, uh, because Ntatia uh, uh, Manuel called, made calls through the night to make sure that, that uh, the, the, the the speaker comes. And I also, I would also like to thank the many South African officials and public representatives who worked together to overcome Professor Piketty's uh, challenge of two pages, as I said. <laughs> I thought I should mention it again. It's important, the number. Thank you to our many sponsors and funders, including Anglo Gold Ashanti, Audi, VW, and I'm told that the cars that you see there are very compliant from VW. <laughs> Brand South Africa, Coca-Cola, Doe and Carolyn Stein, Nashua Central, APSA, Rent Merchant Bank, Rupert and Rothschild, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, and Vodacom. I must tell you that uh, I must tell you that when Professor Piketty walked in the room, he looked at one of the sponsors there and it, he saw the logo of uh, Rosa Luxemburg. He said. I find this fascinating. You're working with Rosa Luxemburg. 
So it means that they are good guys for us to work with. <laughs> to the staff of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, to all of you, I say a big, big thank you. I wish I could read out the names of all 22 staff members who made this possible today, but safe to say that the communications and outreach team, I'd like to thank you, single you out, and thank you very much for having done the work that you did. You have indeed done us proud. To Nikki Webikicha, our host, you are fantastic. Thank you very much. Lastly, but certainly not least, to say thank you to all of you for attending today and for watching on television and the internet, especially those campuses, different campuses that were mentioned, who joined us today. Ultimately, it is with you, because of you, and it is with you, that the success of this lecture will continue. And again, the success was measured with the long queues that we had outside. So I'd like to say again, thank you very much, merci beaucoup. At this, uh, at this stage, I'd like to call on our artist for the day, who's going to come and uh, serenade us with uh, some music to come and give us uh, two items. Um, just to say that in the middle of the second item, our honored guests will then vacate the stage. If you can, please remain seated. Um, do not move, just remain seated. Um, if you can, please remain seated. So the, the artist... We're coming to you live from the University of Johannesburg, Soweto campus, a buzz today. You've just seen Selo Hatang, the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, thanking UJ for hosting the 13th annual Nelson Mandela lecture and saying it was elegant. It was very elegant indeed, well attended, uh, and, and the audience was participating today. The man of the moment, uh, French economist Thomas Piketty, a world-renowned expert basically on inequality uh, and a lot of applause a standing ovation at the end but a lot of applause when he spoke about uh, the need for transparency around the assets uh, that are held in South Africa who owns what land for example uh, we know that income inequality in South Africa is very high uh, we are in the one of the most unequal countries in the world 60% uh, he says of income going to the top 10% but beyond income Income, actual wealth, actual assets, pretty obscure uh, and, and really a lot of applause. I'm joined uh, by economics editor Tandeka Pule and uh, just your impression, uh, you were in the audience. I think it was riveting and it was an enormous pleasure and an honor for the SABC to bring the special broadcast to, to almost 20 African countries today and it throws wide open the question of what the benefits of society are and who they are owned by and how they are shared and that is a story and an, an issue not just for South Africa alone but for the entire continent and I, I was particularly intrigued by Piketty's prescription for South Africa which had four main points and the first one is access to quality jobs and decent work. And he said that we should consider a well-calibrated minimum wage. And the second part was quality education. You know, Francis, we've made a lot of strides with access to education, but we have battled to bring quality education to ordinary children. And he says in his book that education is a great equalizer, and if we can use this ladder of education to equalize um, the stakes in society between the different classes, then we will be a long way. He also talks about infrastructure, the need for powerful, good public infrastructure that can be accessed by the poor, and also, of course, his prescription on taxation, which is the most controversial. Well, I'm pretty glad because he, he arrived in South Africa saying that he was here to learn. Uh, but obviously, these academics all want to pick Thomas's, uh, Piketty's brain. And at least he did give those prescriptions. I think that was really valuable, uh, like you say, around education. And, and he wants a wealth tax. Uh, and you say controversial, uh, but he would like to, he, he did say it would help transparency to collect who owns what, basically. 
Yes, he, he attacked the opaqueness of how we account for wealth, particularly the invisibility of wealth in South Africa. As you have said, Francis, we are one of the most unequal societies in the world, if not the most unequal. And 60% of the country's output and what we create goes to the top 10%, and surely that is unsustainable. He argued passionately in the beginning of his speech that such levels of inequality lead to violence. Well, uh, thank you very much, Tandeka, and uh, thank you to uh, you, Jay. It was really uh, elegantly hosted, uh, the, U the University of Johannesburg giving Thomas Piketty an honorary doctorate, which he accepted. Now, consider that he rejected uh, other honors in France. He accepted this, and uh, Tandeka speaking to uh, the vice chancellor earlier, saying that what they really enjoy about Piketty is that he's not only an academic looking at the data, but an activist dealing with some uh, so crucial in South Africa in the world today in equality. So that's it from us. Uh, we cross back to studio. That's a wrap from UJ Campus in Soweto. It doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. It's a pre-record, so we can take it out. We can take it out. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's a pre-record, hey? So I'm taking it out. Okay. Uh, Just put it here for now. Must I stand here? So he's over shoulder. We'll start from here. Favor my camera. Favor your camera. Okay. So I'm gonna left. Okay, got it. You'll cue me in, hey? Are you ready? We won't keep you long. <laughs> Okay, we are ready if you guys are ready. Five, two, one, stand by. So we're coming to you from uh, the University of Johannesburg Soweto campus. The lecture by a renowned economist, Thomas Piketty, has ended and a lot of VIPs here uh, attending today. Or one of them, the Gauteng Premier David Makura, he chats to me now. Great to have you with us. Uh, Premier, what did you think? Uh, well, Francis, uh, firstly, I'm here because the, as uh, one of the policymakers in our country, we're deeply uh, interested in any new insights and uh, new ideas about uh, uh, the challenges of uh, inequality, poverty, and, of course, unemployment. And today was essentially about uh, trying to, uh, through the spectacles of uh, Professor Piketty, to gain insights into the, this uh, fundamental question of inequality. And I must say that uh, he gave a very thought-provoking lecture, uh, fascinating and uh, very helpful in uh, especially get, getting those who, of us in South Africa who are deeply committed uh, to social uh, transformation in our country. And, and, and for us, particularly me in government and many who are involved uh, in policy making, to reflect on our policies and whether the policies we are implementing uh, will get outcomes that are, are more equitable, uh, that will ensure that uh, the overwhelming majority of our people uh, are brought right at the center of what, what governance is about and what economics is about. So this, this was a fascinating uh, work by someone who reflects from where he is.
He, he actually gave uh, prescriptions reluctantly. He's spoken about um, a wealth tax to figure out who owns what in South Africa. He endorses the, the minimum wage. Most of his prescriptions in his book are on a global uh, level, you know, uh, reducing tax havens, things like that. Is there anything that Gauteng, anything practical uh, that, that as a province we can take away and say maybe that's something we can look at? Anything thought-provoking for you? Well, let me first say that uh, I think the question of inequality is quite huge. You know, we are uh, the biggest uh, part of South Africa's economy. Uh, we have highest concentration of wealth and individuals and, uh, and groups that are are much wealthier, what he was talking about, about the top 10%. Uh, so we, and, and so side by side with that wealth, uh, you have a uh, deep deprivation, people who live on the periphery of, uh, of our communities and the province. Uh, so the, some of the important questions he raises about whether, uh, you know, we, we're getting uh, those who are wealthy to contribute enough uh, to get a, a society to a, a level much better given our history. Uh, those are the questions we must examine. We also, he spoke very, very profusely about the question of transparency. And this question of transparency is fundamental. Transparency in the way we make decisions, at, as exactly transparency about who owns what, and transparency about uh, 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 both our history, whether we, you know, the, the assets and the wealth of, uh, of these countries is still in the hands of those who would like us not to look. He talked about historical amnesia. Uh, and, and of course, he also spoke about uh, the need for us to, to look at the, uh, whether we are doing enough. I mean, when he was comparing uh, uh, us, uh, the French Revolution, we must never think, well, we have a democracy now that's, that's equals to equality. We must never think we have freedom and, and then suddenly we are all equal. We must work ceaselessly. Uh, painstakingly to ensure that the overwhelming majority of uh, uh, black, black South Africans, women, uh, young people uh, are at the heart of, of, of building a society that is more caring. So for me, I come here uh, pretty well provoked, uh, uh, but I, I also come here inspired that we certainly have to continue to pursue in new ways, yes. I mean, in fact, radical economic transformation should mean we have to look at the things we are doing uh, continuously in new ways. Issues of land reform and uh, asset uh, redistribution, is issues of education uh, and infrastructure, you know, access to that. Uh, uh, so we, we have to continue to look at all these things and we must never be satisfied until the overwhelming majority of South Africans enjoy truly what is a better life. Some of what he says echoes what the ANC has been saying. But what if you are a, a rich person living in Gauteng, you believe you've uh, helped this country, should you be fearful? I, I think that the, one of the fundamental questions is that those of us uh, who are little, a little bit better, and then there are many who are much wealthier, what can we contribute uh, to get in South Africa to a state of a more equitable society? Uh, and he, he raised fundamental questions about that, that, that we need, we, we must not be impatient with the fact that the present is very much a reflection of, of the past. And the future can only be created out of grappling with both the present and the past. Final question, is this a boost for uh, Soweto? People have been watching the, this lecture uh, from across Africa, I don't know where else. Well, well, Francis, I'm fascinated about the turnout first. And the fact that it was taken to Soweto was a very good decision by the, the Nelson Mandela Foundation and the University of Johannesburg. Because if we want to deal with issues of poverty and inequality, uh, we, especially we in Gauteng, talk about the townships. And that's where the full manifestations of, of the world of yesterday and the and, the, and that of today is, is showing up. How much progress have we made? There are those who have moved forward and there are those who are still very much deep in the, 
in the in the circumstances of our history. So having come to Soweto was a very good decision. We talk about the revitalization of the township economy as a very fundamental, important question of uh, addressing inequality. Uh, so I'm very pleased that it is happening in Soweto. And, and you can see there's lots of support here. People have come to Soweto, but also the people of Soweto are here. I'm, I'm very happy that there are so many South Africans who are who are interested on this fundamental question of inequality. I mean, they were responding very well to every single point that Professor Piketty was raising. So this, for me, I would say Nelson Mandela must, must be smiling that there are many, so many South Africans who, who are keen to address uh, the fundamental question of inequality uh, by so doing, uh, leave the dream of Nelson Mandela. Even on a day when we're playing uh, rugby, it's, it's been a great uh, turnout. And thank you for your time, Gauteng Premier David Makura. And that's a wrap uh, from uh, the University of Johannesburg's Soweto campus.